Hey, what's up out there, everybody? Welcome to Movies Never Say Die. I'm Anthony DeJoya, and this is your home for 80s and 90s retro movie content. I'm continuing my journey of the lost movies from the 1990s. This is episode three. Got 10 more movies, one from each year. This episode will deliver everything from suspense to sci-fi with some action, a splash of horror, a trip to the World Series, and more. So let's get into it. This comedy came out in 1990 and it stars James Belushi as Jimmy Dworsky, a regular guy who loves sports and is about to finish a short jail sentence. Jimmy Dworsky is about to get a new life. The only problem is it's somebody else's life in Arthur Hiller's Taking Care of Business, also starring Charles Grodin. Many of you in the UK may know this movie as Philo Facts, but here in the States it was called Taking Care of Business, and I still think it's a fun, feel-good comedy that certainly does have its flaws, but still easily manages a great time while watching, primarily, I think, because of the fast pace that this silly plot explores, and just from the charm delivered by this likable cast. I think James Belushi is just uh, perfect as this common guy who, despite being a little bit schmucky, is a good-hearted dude that just wants to see his team play in the World Series, and seeing him do anything he can to attain that is a comical ride. Then you get Charles Grodin, who plays it much more grounded to deliver his own type of humor, and I think together they're a capable comedic duo for the needs of this movie. Belushi stumbles into this guy's life, and everything works in his favor, and Grodin sees his life disappear with anything that can go wrong going wrong and it's a mindless blast that delivers a high energy ending that still holds up as a charming comedy all these years later Now, this horror movie centers on that one house in the neighborhood that the adults would whisper about and the kids would cross the street to pass in 1991's The People Under the Stairs, written and directed by Wes Craven, starring Brandon Adams, Everett McGill, Wendy Robbie, and A.J. Langer. I can see where the people under the stairs may be a little too out there for some of you, but I do contend that if you give this movie a chance and overlook some of its silliness, that this is a fun, effective haunted house flick that has solid moments of suspense, moments of unnerving tension, and a light dose of humor to just cut the evil atmosphere of this story to deliver a fun, wild ride of horror and frights. I think the cast overall is solid, uh, primarily from McGill and Robbie, who just absolutely capture the cartoonish insanity of these over-the-top characters to a T. They're both completely unhinged in this movie, and as a young teen and as a kid watching this movie, they always creeped me out. The makeup effects, I think, are still effective in creating the eeriness of these people living in the walls, and I think this suburban home just serves as a great playground for the close quarter horrors and thrills, but really what makes this movie so much fun is that I think it knows what it is. The story between all the suspenseful action is very short and sweet and effective. It really connects the demented chaos of this simple plot more than enough to make this movie a great time every Halloween season. This action comedy follows George Cuffs. He didn't graduate high school and he just lost his job. But when his brother is killed in the line of duty, he inherits a small patrol district in 1992's Cuffs, directed by Bruce A. Evans, starring Christian Slater, Mila Hobovich, Tony Goldwyn, and Leon Rippey. This was a movie that I watched countless times as a kid, being a huge Slater fan, and to this day, I still think the mix of action and comedy that Cuffs delivers is a fun time. This one feels like a 80s action movie cut with an early 90s comedy, complete with Slater's character routinely breaking the fourth wall to bring that slight Ferris Bueller touch to things, which does pull you into the story with him, and sure, they're are some contrasting tones in this movie spots really intend to hit the heartstrings others aim for mindless laughs but that's also kind of just part of the nostalgia that this movie brings it's a silly story for sure but the movie is clearly having fun with itself i think a slater is comfortable and capable in the lead and i think leon rippy as the eccentric cane is a treat the villain in this movie is cartoonish as he wears shirts with his own picture on it yet it all just i think blends into the light 
light atmosphere and vibe of this movie overall. I think it's tightly paced and with a balance of action set pieces and a jovial sense of humor, Cups has just a simplistic charm that still holds up. Next up is a mystery thriller that asks if someone you loved mysteriously vanished, how far would you go to find them in The Vanishing from 1993, directed by George Schluzer, starring Jeff Bridges, Kiefer Sutherland, and Nancy Travis. I was born in Los Angeles and I lived there as a kid with my grandmother until the crack epidemic of the 80s came around and made the neighborhood far too dangerous. So uh, she moved me up to the sticks of Washington to live with my aunt and uncle in a little town called Snohomish. The Vanishing was actually partially filmed in my town. I remember seeing where they were filming parts of this movie and I still contend that this is an intriguingly ominous and moody thriller. I think Sutherland really captures the desperation of a normal man searching for answers and Jeff Bridges. Bridges is just plenty eerie, but still unassuming, and I think seeing the layers of his evil peel back in this movie is a suspenseful and emotionally gripping escape. I haven't seen the original, and I have heard that it is a superior film with a much darker ending, but as it is, this movie does have its appeal. I think it's very well acted, the emotional pull is more than effective, and I think Sluzer's direction is foreboding and dramatic when needed to give the story the proper ebbs and flows of emotional tones the vanishing may have its issue it may bumble the ending a tad as well but it still delivers a dramatic ride that will have you asking how far you would go to find a missing loved one This next movie was an inside look at college basketball where victory doesn't come cheap. And if you're going to win at any cost, you're going to have to be prepared to pay the price in Blue Chips from 1994, directed by William Friedkin, starring Nick Nolte, J.T. Walsh, Mary McDonald and Ed O'Neill. I've always been a sports fan, specifically of basketball, football, and baseball, and I really loved Blue Chips as a teenager who had dreams of playing college basketball and maybe going pro. The Sonics never called me up to be their starting point guard, and at the time this movie was released, it wasn't so well received, but I think it's just because it was ahead of its time. The movie, not me. I'm Italian and short, not really NBA material, but when this movie was released, college basketball and football was just blowing up. TV deals were bringing in millions of dollars and I don't think people were really interested in a peek behind the scenes at the business of college basketball and college sports but all these years later as a reflective look back I think Blue Chips is a very much a stronger watch really as it just pulls the curtain back just enough to create an intriguing story that does focus more on the morality points than it does the business aspects. I think Nolte is solid in the lead as a fiery veteran coach that finds the business of basketball changing all around him. There are also a lot of NBA players in this film to make the basketball feel legit, and Blue Chips isn't necessarily Moneyball-level expose on the inner workings of college sports, but uh, like the program did for football, it delivers just enough substance to blend with its Hollywood storytelling to result in a film that can still deliver an entertaining watch all these years later. Next up is a truly one-of-a-kind movie from 1995 about a data courier with information inside of his head that he must deliver before dying in Johnny Mnemonic, starring Keanu Reeves, Dina Meyer, Ice-T, and Dolph Lundgren as The Street Preacher, directed by Robert Longo. Something that I always loved about 80s and 90s movies were those random films that took a chance, swung for the fences to make something completely odd and unique, and few films fit into that category as easily as I think Johnny Mnemonic does. This movie is just wild and eccentric and bonkers in so many amazing ways. The story is equally ridiculous and interesting. The cast overall is a strong ensemble. You get Reeves in the lead, who's just great. He's showcasing a perfect level of self-awareness. Then you get the tertiary characters from uh, Meyer and Rollins and Ice-T who all add their own flavor to their characters. Then on the villain side, you get the talents of Dolph Lundgren, who just goes all in on this performance as the street preacher. So the ensemble here is excellent. Then you just toss them all into this futuristic cyberpunk setting and you give them a high tension mission. And the result is a true escape of bizarre style, violent action and charismatic performances that know exactly what this movie was supposed to be. And the result is a cult classic from Keanu Reeves that doesn't get mentioned enough. 
Coming up next is a tense thriller that explored the dangers of extreme fanaticism when a superstar baseball player finds his life just turned upside down in Tony Scott's loose remake of The Fan from 1996, starring Wesley Snipes, Robert De Niro, Ellen Barkin, and John Leguizamo. I've always been a fan of Wesley Snipes and Robert De Niro, so I remember seeing this movie in theaters and I absolutely loved it and I still enjoy it today. I think the fan essentially delivers the complete package for those looking for a mid-90s thriller that thrives on its style, its leading stars, some slick direction, and an undercurrent of emotional intensity that's able to dig just enough below the surface to intrigue the story does have its holes but it's well written overall the subplots are given just enough depth and it keeps a swift pace now i will admit the final act does go way over the top than what it needs to it does kind of undercut the more serious and grounded film built in the first two acts however both snipes and de niro are awesome in these characters snipes really feels at home in a role that he played back in major league so he really has the athleticism of a ball player and he has the gravitas of a superstar athlete as well and then you get de niro who just shines in a truly dark and demented performance so when these two finally come to a head in the closing it makes the fan a satisfying ride into the dark side of sports fandom Written and directed by Von D. Curtis Hall, this next movie centers on two drug addicts who desperately want to kick their habits but find help seemingly impossible to find when attempting to enroll in government-assisted detox programs in Gridlock from 1997 starring Tupac Shakur, Tim Roth, and Van Duy Newton. Many of you would assume that a film about a couple of heroin addicts attempting to go clean could end up being a depressing and slow and heavy-handed movie, but if you've seen Gridlocked, you will know what I mean when I say this movie is really able to thrive on its offbeat humor and its high-energy edginess. This movie, at the same time, is effortlessly able to bring natural humor from a couple of frustrated characters, but it's also able to explore the issues with government bureaucracies all within an informative lens. I think Gridlocked is super gritty, but it's also unassumingly elegant at times, and I think the juxtaposition between these tones really results in an engaging film that can sweep you up and have you invested in the grounded mission of its characters. This one actually came out four months after the murder of Tupac, and he delivers a charged performance, as does Roth, who pumps life into this character as well, and I think he and Tupac really are perfect for the needs of this movie. It delivers action, humor, emotion, style, and knowledge all within its very entertaining 90-minute runtime. Next up is a college comedy about a couple of failing students that discover they can get passing grades if one of their roommates kills themselves. In 1998's Dead Man on Campus, directed by Alan Cohn, starring Mark Paul Gossler, Tom Everett Scott, and Poppy Montgomery. I'll always have a particular fondness for this movie as it came out when I was in college and I feel I related to the character played by Gosler probably a little too much, both in good and bad ways as a guy who spent nine years in college, six of which were at a two-year school, but... I can see where this movie won't be to everybody's tastes, as it is a little bit more than mean spirited. However, that's the whole entire point of the film. And for that aspect, I think this movie absolutely succeeds at being a fun, humorous, easily engaging college comedy. Sure, there are some dumb jokes and characters that don't work so well, but there are just as many dumb jokes and characters that deliver a riot of laughter. I think Gosler and Scott are a solid duo. Gosler specifically, who is just the, uh, he's essentially playing Van Wilder before Reynolds. He's the spotlight of this movie. He is the driving force of the humor. There are also some clever spots of comedy woven into this pleasantly cruel plot from strong jokes to comical situations. Dead Man on Campus throws it all at you within its short runtime, and it's still a lighthearted roller coaster of dark comedy all these years later. This next crime thriller follows an undercover cop who takes on a ruthless crime lord. He knew the risks, but not how far he would have to go in 1991's Into Deep, starring LL Cool J, Omar Epps, Nia Long, and Stanley Tucci, directed by Michael Reimer. Now, I will admit this movie doesn't necessarily bring anything new to the undercover cop thriller, and it certainly does mold itself right in there to pretty much follow the formula beat for beat, from the 
close calls to the character tests of moralities. You've seen this movie before. However, you wouldn't be able to tell this was a recycled story from watching the film because In Too Deep, I think, does deliver plenty of effort. The cast certainly makes the effort to take these routine characters and make them their own. I think Epps is a solid lead. He hits the highs and lows effectively. I think Stanley Tucci is great as the handler. Uh, Nia Long makes the most of a generic role. Then front and center is LL Cool J, who just owns this character he has his usual charisma but the sadistic undercurrent to his performance really is what makes this movie hold up and overall i think this one brings really enough style enough grit a thin layer of emotional intensity and plenty of violence to compensate for its creative shortcomings and that's it for today, guys. Episode three of the Lost Movies from the 1990s is in the books. Ten strong movies from a great decade in cinema. All of these movies, in my opinion, are still worth checking out today. Let me know down in the comments if you've seen some of these movies. Tell me what you think of them. Uh, thank you guys, as always, for watching. I greatly appreciate you all. Be on the lookout for episode four coming very soon. I hope to see you guys all back for that one. And until then, movies never say die. Jack Burton and the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. Survive a war. You gotta become war. I suppose we have to register you as a lethal weapon. You trying to say Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball?